The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is an image of the Miami Hurricanes, taken in 2006. The team is observing a moment of silence for one of their players that had passed away. His name was Brian Pata. He played as a defensive lineman and was a criminology major. He joined the Miami Hurricanes immediately out of high school, and everybody on the team recognized that he had a pretty cool personality. Unfortunately, though, one member of his team, named Richard Jones, didn't feel the same way. And during one night at Brian Pata's home, Richard Jones had an altercation with him and shot him. The murder went unsolved for over a year, and this picture was taken within that time. Number 38 is Richard Jones, the only one in the team with his eyes open, staring at Brian Pata, the teammate that he killed in cold blood. This is Andre Crawford. He was born in 1962, and he was an American serial killer. He is responsible for the deaths of 11 women between the years 1993 and 1999. His crimes were based out of Chicago, and many of the women that he killed were prostitutes. Like most serial killers, he had a terrible family life, and when CPS removed him from his biological mother and placed him into a foster home, his foster parents consistently beat him. At the age of 18, he enlisted himself into the army, but was removed on a dishonorable discharge. After this, the murders began. He would be caught and sentenced to life in prison because of a DNA test connecting him to all 11 murders. And in prison, he became an artist. He draws pictures like this. Almost all of his drawings and paintings depict women being harmed. Many people like to point out that when serial killers or criminals in general create art in prison, a lot of themes can be found. One of the major ones being that most of the drawings appear flat. The conclusion being that serial killers and criminals in general are sociopaths who only view people as a means to an end an object to be manipulated. They draw faces and people like you and I would draw a table. They only add enough detail for the onlooker to identify whatever they drew to be a human. Anything more than that they're not concerned with. It's almost like we get a rare look into how sociopaths and psychopaths view the world, and it's truly frightening to say the least. Personally, in my opinion, images and videos convey a message a lot stronger than words do. You can inform or warn people of anything, but there's no guarantee that your caution will stick in their head. But when you offer someone a visual, when you give them a video to watch or a picture to look at, that's when the information stays. I want the audience to consider what I've said when they look at a picture like this. This is the aftermath of a car accident. The person in the front passenger seat wasn't wearing their seatbelt, and during that sudden stop, their head collided with the windshield, killing them instantly. And I have to point out that the most eerie part of this photo isn't what's shown, it's what's absent. You see, this car is being prepared to be scrapped, and before that, they must clean everything up. All of the hair, blood, and brain fluid that will be coated across the entire glass and inside of the car. I want everyone watching right now to close their eyes and picture this with me. Picture that a building is on fire and that you're about to jump out, but there's a stranger behind you who's ready to jump out too. You guys are both forced by the window because you can't go down the stairs, you can't escape the hallway. You both jump out. What's the first thing you do? That's a difficult question to answer. The situation itself is very frantic. You'd most likely be acting unpredictably. So it'd be a challenge to gauge what your actions would really be. This picture depicts the very situation I just described to you. The only difference being is that the two people aren't strangers, they're firefighters. They didn't survive the fall, but during the fall they chose to do the only thing that made sense at the time, hold each other's hand and wish for the best. This young boy's name is Hans Goreg. He was born in 1928 and he died the 6th of October 1997, age 69. 
These pictures were taken when he was 16 years old. He was a member of the Hitler Youth, and when his mother and father died a few years earlier, he joined the Luftwaffe in order to earn some money. During his time as a part of the Luftwaffe, he developed PTSD, and when he was captured by the 9th US Army in Germany on April 3rd of 1945, these images were taken, and these pictures add a lot of context to what Hans was dealing with. It's obvious that he's a broken child who only joined the war effort out of necessity. This image in particular speaks to me the most. You can see the desperation, you can see the fear, you can see the anxiety. And he had to bear all of that alone. He had no one to lean on. And when he was captured, the US soldiers chose to not bring him back to a POW camp. They just told him to go home, that the war was over, and that he didn't have to play a part in it anymore. This is Isaac Woodward Jr. Born on March 18, 1919 in Fairfield County, South Carolina, Isaac aspired to join the Army out of high school, and at the age of 23, he did. He served in the Pacific Theater in a labor battalion. After that, he was quickly promoted to sergeant, and quickly after earned many awards, one of them being the World War II Victory Medal. He was given an honorable discharge, and when he went back home, he encountered something terrible. On February 12, 1946, Isaiah got onto a Greyhound bus. During the ride, Isaiah was keeping his eye out for rest stops. He needed to use the bathroom. As one approached, he asked the bus driver to slow down and let him off so that he could go. The bus driver thought that Isaiah was being disruptive, and by the time Isaiah got back onto the bus, the bus driver had decided to contact police at a stop further up. When they reached that new stop, Isaiah was ordered off of the bus and was accused of publicly drinking on the bus with other soldiers. He would be put into a patrol car, taken to an alleyway, and then was beaten with nightsticks by multiple police officers. After that, he was taken to the local jail and bludgeoned even more for not saying yes sir when he was asked questions. The beating was so bad that he went blind in both eyes. Nightsticks were jammed into his eyes, permanently destroying them. And he would have gone without medical attention if his family wasn't looking for him. He was found at a hospital and was receiving subpar treatment. The treatment was so bad that it took even more weeks for most of his memory to come back. At that point, he had major amnesia from constant blows to his head. His case was picked up by the NAACP, and his story was shared publicly on multiple different newspapers. His picture was everywhere, but unfortunately that was not enough. The police officers involved in this attack were acquitted of all charges after 30 minutes of jury deliberation. This came as a shock because the police officers, when they were asked whether or not they blinded Isaiah, answered yes. They admitted to the whole act, and many people pointed out that during their confession, they didn't seem remorseful. They were proud of their actions and weren't scared of any repercussions. This is Istvan Reiner. He was four years old. This picture shows him holding a hole punch and smiling. Little did he know that just a few weeks later, he and 10,000 other people would be executed in the world's worst way. His parents were unknown. His background is unknown. And this picture is the only proof that he existed. This is Daniela Pogali. She was an Italian nurse, and for 30 years, she had been poisoning patients. During her time working as a nurse, Daniela was able to kill 40 people. And the reason why? Well, it's simple. They annoyed her. Every patient that she unfortunately came across had some sort of issue that she didn't want to deal with. So instead, she would inject them with poison and watch them die. And when they would die, she would pose with the bodies. During her trial, she attempted to apologize for her actions, saying that she didn't quite understand what she was doing. She was dubbed the Angel of Death by the prosecutor and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Shell shock, a term developed in World War I to describe the symptoms and behaviors that we would classify under post-traumatic stress disorder. One behavior displayed by those with post-traumatic stress disorder is the thousand yard stare, a behavior that is typically characterized as perpetual shock. And after World War I, many men displayed this behavior. These men would have trouble walking, trouble speaking, heightened anxiety and paranoia, 
and of course, the thousand yard stare. Unfortunately, during this time, many people didn't seek help for these symptoms. Many people during that time believed that shell shock was a made up term to be an excuse for cowardice. Many people who struggled with PTSD while fighting the war were either executed or jailed for cowardice because they no longer had the ability to fight. The average tree weighs about one ton, and it takes about 20 to 35 miles per hour to pick that one ton tree up and toss it at anything nearby. In this picture, the tree wasn't thrown, it fell, and the woman and child inside were crushed to death. They were returning home from picking out pumpkins for Halloween. To the men in the audience, I want to ask you a question. To what extent would you go to propose to your girlfriend? And while you think about that, let me tell you a story about this Louisiana man. He and his girlfriend went to Tanzania to stay at an underwater hotel. While his girlfriend was taking pictures inside of their room, he chose to jump into the water and swim down to the window to see her. He then places this message onto the window for her to read. It says, I can't hold my breath long enough to tell you everything I love about you. Everything I love about you, I love more every day. Will you please be my wife? Unfortunately, when he shows her the ring, he begins to lose air. He quickly tries to swim up, but the hotel room was 30 feet down. He doesn't reach the surface in time, and he drowned. His girlfriend never had the opportunity to tell him in person that she wanted to marry him, that she said yes. The only time she was able to say that, unfortunately, was at his funeral. What's up everyone, it's your boy Ailerus, aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you like the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe, fam. What you doing watching videos and not subscribing? And if you're old, make sure to hit that bell so you get these notifications every time. I know that this video was supposed to come out on Friday, but I chose to move it to today because it's Halloween. And I made sure that this video was super packed full of content, and I hope you guys enjoyed. The Morbid Reality series consistently gets demonetized, and I wouldn't be able to do it without my Patreon supporters, so a big thank you to Aversian, Ashleep, Queen Kajina, Tazluth, A Generic Fox Fur, Drago Scuffy, Soup, Viva LaRue, Witty Username, I Didn't Bought My Viewers True, Benny's Big Bean Burrito, Danny Wanny Has a Big Fanny, Spunky Funky Monkey Chunky Chunky, Tinky Winky Nobby Wobby, Upanute, D for C, My Name to Knee, Kiri the Sloth, Lady Laughs a Lot, Mina the Swift, E Sow Destroyer, Muffy Lou Who, Noah, Vermont, John Robinson, Eva, Catherine Taylor, Hannah, and Will Billy. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.